been putting up some videos, getting into a little more of how Atmos kind of works. I had a video exploring how the arrays work, talked about object beds. There's something I feel like I need to mention. I don't have as much information and understanding of this as I wish I did, but it is something that I think is important to think about. And I know that lately there have been some home theater folks joining us, which is great. I mean, I'll just be honest, the content that I'm putting out, I'm gearing this more towards professionals who are working in Dolby Atmos and especially professionals really focused on music. But if you are a home theater enthusiast, I mean, hey, welcome. When it comes to delivering Dolby Atmos content, you know, Dolby Atmos, we have up to 128 objects. I mean, it's not really 128 because 10 of those are for the bed. And if you're in an older setup, you've got LTC probably on one of those. So, you know, there's still like, we're, we're still over a hundred things. Maybe we'll say you can have in Atmos in a theatrical presentation, you know, go over to your, your Dolby equipped theater. They've got Atmos. I believe in that theatrical, cinematic experience, go over to your favorite Dolby equipped theater. I believe the DCP has all 128 objects, beds, everything in the full Atmos is in that presentation. So you get the whole thing, all the pan through arrays, everything that can possibly happen. Now, when it comes to home formats, whether you're streaming music, Apple Music, Amazon, or you're maybe watching a movie off of Apple TV, Amazon Prime, you know, Vudu, whatever your your favorite digital streaming is, even even if you're not streaming, even if you're on physical media, you know, 4K Blu-ray or Blu-rays, Atmos at home does not have the full 128 because it's just not practical to deliver that much data presently. It's not practical to deliver it at home. The size requirements, it's, it's just, it's not happening right now. So in the encoding process, there is something that takes place that Dolby calls spatial, spatial coding. And this is not to be confused with Apple Music's spatial audio. They're different things. So what is spatial coding? Spatial coding is just the process that is going to reduce that full Atmos down to a smaller number of things so that you can actually present it at home and not take up a ton of data size. What Dolby Atmos does, I'm just going to I'm just going to read this right off the website and I'll put up a graphic that kind of shows a little bit of what this is doing. So it says, spatial coding is employed to reduce 128 bed and object channels to 12 or 16 elements or clusters. There are some versions of this that I've seen where you can do 14, but in most cases these days, I believe it's 12 or 16. And I'm pretty sure most people are using 16, although... Some of that is going to get determined when the bit budgeting is done, like for a Blu-ray or, you know, 4K Blu-ray, when they're trying to figure out what can we actually fit on this disc, that's when they're sort of deciding. My hope is they're doing all 16 these days, but there might be some films out there that are only using 12. But anyways, let me keep going. Spatial coding reduces 12 or 16 elements or cluster. Actually, this is really 11.1 or 15.1 as the LFE doesn't move. So it's really 11 or 15 because the LFE, LFE takes up a thing. All right, so spatial coding is reducing everything to these clusters. 
Spatial coding works by employing an algorithm to dynamically group audio into dynamic elements. Audio can move from cluster to cluster, and the clusters themselves move as needed. While reducing the channel count from 128 to 16 sounds significant, keep in mind that the full number of audio bed channels or objects are rarely active at the same time. So, Full Atmos, basically, it is getting condensed to, let's just say, about 16 or really 15 things because the LFE LFE is eating up one of those. Gee, it would be nice to change that, in my opinion. I would love to have 16 rather than that LFE. But that's another discussion. So I want to show you guys something. I have an ADM loaded of a mix I did for McCall Connor. Uh, this single was called This Side of Heaven. I'm not going to play it today. If you want to listen to it, go listen to it on Apple Music or Tidal. But I want to show you some stuff in here while we're talking about this spatial coding, just to give you an idea. This was something I did. I did this mostly with objects, and there's a little bit of movement. So when you look at this here, we can see all of the different objects going. So this object right here, some of these you can see they're moving around and bouncing around. So this 43 and 44, that's kind of going back and forth. This 48, that's the kind of stuff that's going to get put into clusters. I mean, all of this really is going to get put into clusters. So I've got this thing rotating here. Looks like a stereo pair of objects. I'm not listening to this, so I don't remember what this was. But you can see how there are things moving in here. Well, all of this for going to home, it's all got to get folded down into basically 15 things. So these objects are going to get clustered with other channels and objects that are close by. Sometimes they might stay objects. Dolby has a patent on how this all works, and you can look into that, and it might give you a little more insight into how the clustering actually works. But this is not what I would expect this mix to look like if I was looking at a Dolby True HD version of it, because this mix, it's going to get folded down into clusters, basically. And there would be less of them than what we're seeing in the full ADM. I guess the point to all this, and to have this rolling in the back of your mind, you know, going back to what I was talking about with arrays, arrays at home aren't necessarily going to work the same as arrays in a movie theater or a large venue that is playing back the full Atmos. With the spatial encoding thing, for us with the Dolby Atmos renderer, we used to have the ability in an older version of the renderer to turn this on and off so that we could monitor it. And in a recent version of the Dolby Atmos renderer, Dolby actually removed that. And I believe that in the documentation they were saying is it doesn't really make a big difference. Like the sonic effect of it is negligible, which I'm not always so sure about that. But right now, that is where Dolby stands on this. They think it is not going to have as big of an impact on the sound. It is supposed to maintain the sound of the full Atmos when it folds down. But if you are looking at one of these object viewers of a home presentation of the Atmos, you're not necessarily going to see exactly what is sonically happening in the mix. There might be things moving in there that were objects in the creation of the Atmos mix, but now they've been folded down into clusters and we're just seeing the clusters and you're not always going to see all of the movement in there. So I would be careful to judge a mix 
by what you see displayed on a viewer. I mean, this is something as engineers we talk about. You know, you have to listen to what's coming out of the speakers. Don't judge a mix by what you see on a screen or a meter or a display. You have to listen to them. So that's one thing I would caution you on. The other thing is, you know, like I was getting into, arrays, arrays at home, they're not necessarily going to work the same way. I would have to look at some of the metadata and how all of that stuff gets folded down and how the bed turns into clusters and how the objects turn into clusters. Because when you get into a situation where these things are being combined, the playback at home, it's not necessarily going to treat it in the same way. So that's some stuff to think about. Now, if you are an engineer, you might hear this and go, oh, we've only got 16 in the end. I should limit myself. And I don't think you should. For us as engineers, we should just keep working and being creative and using the tools however we want to, to create the mixes that we want and that our artists and clients want, the things that really help make the most out of the music, that make the most out of the movies, TV, all that kind of stuff, video games. We really should just use all the tools we have to create the best version of that. And I think it's a good thing to have rolling around in the back of your head about how some of that stuff works. But I don't think we necessarily need to let that limit what we're doing at this time. I might change my mind on that. I do wish Dolby would put the spatial coding monitoring back into the renderer, even if it is basically going to sound the same in my studio. I want to be able to check that as a creator. I want to be able to make the call. And if it does change something, I want to be able to make a change in the mix to compensate for that. So that's, that's spatial coding. So anyways, you got Dolby Atmos questions. You've got other stuff you want to add. Please throw it down in the comments. If you understand this spatial coding better than me, which is very, very possible because there isn't a whole lot of documentation in the Dolby training on this. I really just kind of know it happens. If you've got something to add on that, please, please, please put it in the comments below. But thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.